It's good to see Ms. Evelyn back today and we continue to pray for her and for her uh, continued healing. So we pray for her if you would. And uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer. We haven't done this in a while and uh, uh, let's get together with someone around you and just spend some time praying maybe for some of the needs of our church and then also for the Lord just to speak to our hearts this morning. And uh, I think that's important. Sometimes when in our busyness to get here, Sometimes we forget to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. So let's spend a little time in, in prayer and just asking the Lord to, to meet with us here this morning. So that'll be again on Thursday, October the 31st, uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. So keep that in mind. Also appreciate everybody that's been participating in the Operation Christmas Child, and I think we've given out quite a few boxes. I know we ordered 24 of the plastic ones, and they're all going. And I think quite a few of the, uh, the, the uh, cardboard ones already, too. So, uh, and those, we're going to be uh, running that and be bringing them back in by the middle of November, and we'll give you a little more detail as far as with the date next week. Uh, also, men's prayer, prayer breakfast coming up on November the 2nd, so keep that in mind and encourage you just to bring somebody with you. Invite someone to come, maybe some of our own. I know not everyone comes out as far as even with their own guys, so invite someone to come with you. Uh, if you have a neighbor or a friend, uh, invite them to come with you as well. So keep these things before you if you would. Uh, just as a prayer request, we, we pray for Addie if you would and also, Jennifer, uh, Addie got her six-month round of shots, and um, anyway, she's really stuffed up in the last couple nights, and last night especially, she is not going to sleep. So anyway, so Jennifer was maybe got two and a half or three hours of sleep last night, and uh, so if you pray for them, if you would, and, and uh, for Addie to be feeling better, and Jennifer gets a rest. So pray for those things that we appreciate. Page 240, The Lily of God. <laughs>
talking about. He knows how to hammer. He knows how to work on lights. He knows how to drive a bus. Don't know what he does. He could do. Yeah, jack of all trades. Jack of all trades.
1871, the great Chicago fire virtually ruined Horatio Stafford. It was almost the biggest trial of his life, but not the biggest. Two years later, 1873, he puts his wife and his four daughters on a ship to sail for England. And the ship runs into another ship and sinks very quickly, and all four girls die, and his wife barely escapes. He hears about the accident, and he receives a telegram from his wife, saying, alone. He gets on a ship and heads to be with his grieving wife, and as he passes over the part of the ocean where the girls went down and were at the bottom, he wrote, when peace like a river attendeth my way, or sorrows like sea billows roar. And you can hear the point. When sorrows like sea billows roar, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. So the question is, how could it be well? And he goes on in the song and he talks about, let this blessed assurance control that God has regarded my helpless estate and Christ has shed his own blood for my soul. He knew Christ loved him. He saw it in the cross. And when he gets to the end, he has Christ coming back with a great triumph, not to judge him, but to save him and to raise his daughters from the dead. So it is well with my soul. No soul quite gets it in terms of its cadence and its tune and especially its words. It doesn't get any better than sorrowful yet always rejoicing through. It is well, it is well with my soul.
and got to talking to him and getting an update. He was in town because, if you all remember, he was here because of the death of his father. But uh, as I chatted with Ron and told him we were praying for him, um, he said, yeah. I said, give me a little update. Tell me what you're doing. And uh, he said, well, I think I got another quick trip to Haiti. You know, it's like we're going to run down to Williamsburg or go out to West End to, to get a meal or something. He's got another quick trip. Uh, so this is a really good up, uh, update on the things that uh, he and his group have been doing uh, in, in the last few weeks. Uh, dear prayer partners and supporters, sometimes so much seems to be happening that's hardly know what to put in our reports. I think this could be a good thing. I'm writing this from Guatemala near the airport where I'm waiting for a couple of brothers to arrive uh, who will be here for the next two weeks with the ministry in Guatemala and Mexico. When they land, we'll hit the road running. We have evangelistic meetings uh, scheduled for numerous locations uh, and our next town institute classes uh, for our pastors and leaders. Pray for us. This really should be great. I just delivered two young evangelists to the airport on Saturday, and they completed the week of work focusing primarily on the youth ministry. And I'll tell you, every time I get one of these letters from my missionaries, because he starts off with their ministry in area schools. And I just think how wonderful it is that they can minister in the local schools, and, uh, you know, we simply can't even do that here. But they ministered in the area schools, our churches, and sharing our leaders Many useful techniques for helping and reaching the youth. As a testimony to their activities, we had four young people trust Christ as their Savior this past week. Now, folks, that's our missionary dollars at work. Uh, we're sending that money, we're sending it to Ron, and he's passing it on through his ministry. And uh, four young people were saved. And he wants to give thanks to Adam Davis, who happens to be his nephew, and also Zach Whiting. Uh, for the, these were the young people that took care of that ministry. The end of the month, we were blessed, we'll, we'll be blessed, with Dr. Sloan and Beacon of Hope Medical Missions. Uh, we will have an intense week of medical clinics in our, our care lane clinics here in this area. Please pray for an exciting evangelistic opportunity. So here we see even Ron is having the medical. You remember here just two, three weeks ago um, when we had the Sallies here, and Lamar told us that all of the difficulty of going out and knocking on doors one at a time, and how difficult it was to get people to come. But when they open up these medical clinics, they come by the hundreds, by the hundreds, and not only do they get their health concerns taken care of, but they also hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, also pray for a ministry in Haiti. Uh, we're in need of, uh, to expand our CareLinks Kid Home. And about 60% finished with the additions on the second floor. Pray for God for us to comply for the helpers, the help that we need. School is also starting. And he said the kids need uniforms, shoes, and supplies. And he says if this message happens to touch anybody's heart, uh, they can still use the funds. Soon we hope to have another uh, circuit of our churches in Cuba. And he says, really pray for the folks over there. They're having such a difficult time, uh, not only in the getting together meeting, uh, but with all of the things that work against them in trying to worship the Lord in Cuba. It's uh, difficult, so he's asked us to lift up those folks in prayer as well. He said, one of our Spanish language churches is here in Florida recently closed. This was very sad experience that a pastor was leading. Uh, he was leading, and he was a really well-known and, and good pastor, but he said Satan just entered into the church, and it caused the entire ministry to shut down. So he says, please pray for them. Thanks for your continued support of our ministry. Thank you for those who adopted one of our orphans in Haiti, which we did. Uh, some still need a sponsor. God has been good. We have seen many step up to help the needs for supplies, vehicles for the ministry, and even special needs of the individual kids. Uh, it means so much to us that God has placed us on your hearts. God bless you all. All the best as we continue serving the Savior, Ron and Francis Maggard. So continue to pray for Ron and all the travel that he does. 
And remember, we still have Chris Figner, we've got the Sallies and the Wins that are home on furlough right now, and they're each traveling thousands of miles across the country. So continue to pray for them, for their safety, and for the effective uh, opportunity that they'll have to gain additional support. So continue to pray for these and all of our missionaries. Thank you. Turn to our hymnal, page uh, 143. Let's all stand. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a poor taste of glory.
mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For those who call upon His name, we will stand. city to evangelize the Mormons. And so, uh, so anyway, so that was what that song was all about, why it was written. And so, uh, anyway, it's a blessing, isn't it? And it is a blessing to be able to realize that we do walk by faith and not by sight. And uh, what a blessing that is, right? <laughs> if we were walking by sight, it would be pretty grim. So, walking by faith, what a blessing that is. Well, we're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 13 as we begin this morning. Matthew chapter 13 and beginning in verse 34. The title of the message here is Before the Foundation of the World. Before the foundation of the world, um, we're going to be looking at a few different portions of scripture this morning, and um, it's not necessarily a lengthy sermon, but as far as the references that we're going to be availing ourselves of, as far as in support, uh, I think that's where we really want to pay attention. And uh, now, I'll start off by saying I know it's a rainy, dreary day, and um, this one's more of a, I guess, more of a, more of a theological, I guess you would say, message. So hang in there. So we start seeing glossy eyed. <laughs> we have to do some calisthenics or something. But, um, but the idea here is, and I was thinking about this thought in my devotions this past week, and I was sharing this with Brother Allen uh, yesterday is in the realization that God's plan from the foundation of the world, ultimately we would say was not only that Jesus Christ would be the savior of the world. Now, we are not omniscient. Um, personally, I'm thankful for that. <laughs> uh, I don't think that, I think we would just hover in a corner if we knew what was probably around the corner for each one of us, uh, we would not be able to live by faith. Uh, we would be definitely living by sight if we were omniscient. Uh, but we have a God who is omniscient, thankfully, and we have all, and He's all, not only all omniscient, He's all powerful. Uh, and so, in with this, we understand that He is in constant control. And we should be eternally thankful for that. And in so being, and in so doing, and carrying out his plans, we would also say that his plans really were from before the foundation of the world were created. And what was that plan? Ultimately, the plan was for our good, but ultimately the bigger picture is not even about us. It's about His glory. That's why He even created us. We sometimes get selfish in, in the understanding in our own minds, in our own thoughts and understanding is thinking, you know, that this is about us down here. 
and it's not. Our main purpose in being created was to glorify God. Still is. The only problem is, is that sin crept in and diverted our attention and bent our will and bent uh, everything that God had planned in the opposite direction. So here this morning, we're going to be looking at a few different passages along this line and then looking at what we have um, and what God has provided before the foundation of the world. Here in Matthew chapter 13, notice in verses 34 and 35. And also, before we read this, I might also just add, as far as context here in these, in these verses, uh, this portion of scripture follows uh, the parable of the sower. It also follows the parable of the wheat and the tares. Also the parable of the mustard seed, and also of the parable of the leaven. And then we see these verses following up with uh, the heels of those uh, various parables. And he says this, Jesus says this, he says, All th these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables. And without a parable he did not speak to them. Why? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. So here in this text, this verse, these verses tell us that there are some things that have been kept secret from the foundations of the world. There are some things that were hidden or a mystery as these verses spell out. Uh, and also before uh, this mystery is spoken of and also other passages, we're going to look at a few of them here uh, over in Romans 16, uh, verses, verse 25. Romans 16, 25, it says this, it says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, According to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. So once again, there in Romans 16 and verse 5, we see this same connotation, the same text. On over one more uh, book further in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse, beginning in verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. It says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Is that an interesting verse? Notice that again, those verse 7 and 8, he says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Why? The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our, of our glory. Does God know everything? Did he know his whole plan? Absolutely. But he kept parts in, as a mystery until it was time to be fulfilled. And that's really what this portion is speaking of. And he goes on to say, in verse 8, he says, Which none of the rulers of this age knew of this time. Why? For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And as we know, what had to happen? What had to happen? It's a question. It's not rhetorical. Jesus had to die. Jesus had to die on the cross, right? So, if the mystery had been fulfilled or made known earlier, then they wouldn't have killed him. And that would be a problem. It would be problematic. Not only at that time, it would be problematic for us today, right? Why? Because Jesus Christ would not have died on the cross. We would not have his shed blood on the cross. That's problematic. And so once again, and as he goes on, he says, They would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but, verse 9, as it is written, Eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. To me, that verse right there, that verse 9, is a, is a sincere blessing. 
Because notice, is it, is it that he's trying to keep something from us as his children? No. Absolutely not. He's not withholding anything good from us. Right. In verse 9, he says, But as it is written, eye is not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. He has our ultimate good uh, in, in store and in mind in everything that he does. But also, keep in mind, the ultimate reason is so that we might glorify him. So as we, as we, uh, and, and that's also, I'm not going to delve into that. That's not what today's all about. Um, that's the problem with the prosperity gospel, with the prosperity preachers, is they make it the central focus off of the Lord and on to what he's doing for us or can do for us if we have enough faith or whatever else they want to add into the, into the pot. But the reality is, is what they're really taking away is the glorification of God. Everything that we do, the, our purpose of being here today is not even about you. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's not about me. It's about glorifying God. It says his children meeting together to come and to worship and to glorify our Savior for who he is. Now, the gravy on top is we get to learn more about it. That's the blessing. But the main central reason for us being here today is not about us at all. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and then as he goes on down in the end of verse 9, and he says the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And then verse 10, the last verse here in this text that we'll look at, it says, but God has revealed them uh, to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of, of God. So, God reveals what he wants, what he wills, when he wants to. At his own discretion and, his, his, and in his own timing. And so that's what we have. Uh, also, over in uh, Colossians, the last thought we'll look at as far as under this portion of the hidden mystery. In Colossians chapter 1 and beginning of verse 25. Colossians chapter 1 beginning of verse 25. And here it says, of which Paul's talking here to the church of Colossae. Um, and he says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. Here he's talking to uh, he's talking to Jews. He's also talking to Gentiles here, individuals who are coming to to faith into the faith of Jesus in Jesus Christ. And he's saying here that this calling that's been given to, to Paul, the main reason was is so that he might fulfill the word of God. There it says in verse twenty five, the mystery verse twenty six, which has been hidden from ages and from generations. Once again. That Jesus Christ was going to come and he was going to die and he was going to be resurrected and he was going to be our Savior. Uh, even though there's been some little snippets and some little glimpses throughout the Old Testament of that going to happen, it was really, it was really, um, it was really held back as far as all of the details. Why? Because it wasn't for those generations. And then whenever it came, and now we see it all spelled out. And that's what Paul's getting at here. And he says in verse 27, he says, To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. So also it was in his own timing. It wasn't just for the Jews of the Old Testament. But his whole plan from, the, from day one was... At the, at the fall was that all mankind might have opportunity to be able to come to know Jesus Christ. It wasn't only the nation of Israel themselves, but it was also in the Gentiles, those outside of Christ, 
And we should be eternally grateful for that. Why? Because that's us. Right. We are the Gentiles. We are the ones not of the nation of Israel. And so God has made a way for all of us to be able to uh, take place. And, and, the, and the idea here is too, and, the, and, and, and I'll say this up front. If you don't get anything else out of this this morning, get this. God in his sovereignty, God in his, uh, in his uh, omniscience, all the various attributes that God is, he doesn't use each one of his attributes to mainly counter what's going on or what happens in this world or what happens in, in our lives. He's not up there like, oh, 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 flip the control, flip the control. You know, something's about to go and we've got to turn this thing around. He's in absolute control. He knows what's going on. He's known it from the very beginning. I think it's a blessing personally that he says that he knows our very name since before the foundation of the world. That's very comforting to my heart to know that he knew all about Justin Vaughn before I was ever born. Um, we have to be able to realize that his absolute sovereignty is not a, um, not a conclusion from this world just being uh, going into sin. His sovereignty didn't start when sin began. It's always been, it'll always continue. So, he's made a way though because of sin, in spite of sin, we really should say, for this world to be able to come to know him and have a personal relationship with him. But we also have to remember that was always the plan. Why? So that we might glorify him. That was the plan. So with that as the premise, let's get into it. And so here again, the thought, main thought is before the foundation of the world. So what has happened? What, what is the blessing? What are the occurrences that have happened since before the foundation of the world? Number one, we would say this. Before there was a sinner, there was a savior. Think about that. Before there was a sinner, there was a savior. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 alludes to this. 1 Peter chapter 1 and beginning in verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 18. We'll read down to verse 20. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct or manner of living received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, before we finish up this thought, verse 20, think about what these verses are saying. In verse 18, he says, knowing, knowing, that's in our own minds, individually, we come to this realization, this knowing, this understanding, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. There, if, if you know Jesus Christ here today, and you place your hope and your confidence in him, that did not occur by any means that you uh, availed yourself of in and of yourself. It was made available because of Jesus Christ. And then he goes, and with that premise, he goes on and he says, corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct and received by tradition from your fathers. Uh, I don't know Jesus Christ today as my personal savior because my parents do. Now, do they know Jesus Christ? Yes. Uh, by all evidence, they do. But Justin Vaughn doesn't know Jesus Christ just because my parents came to know Jesus Christ. Because of the traditions of my fathers. It's because of my understanding and my coming to believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I accepted him um, as my personal savior. Then he comes down with that premise again into verse 20. He says, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. <laughs> See this? Now this? This is hard for us to get our minds around because we're, we're finite. 
We can only think in terms of beginning, ending. That's how we, that's how we operate. But to be able to get our minds around this in that he's done all of this, he's made himself a sacrifice, and he says in verse 20, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. This was the plan since before the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ would be offered in our place. But it was made manifest. It was, it was came to be, he says there at the end of verse 20, manifest in these last times for you. And once again, he's talking to into with everyone. He's talking to Jew, he's talking to Gentile. And God's plan was that Jesus Christ would be would be uh, killed, but also that he'd be raised and he would be seated on the right hand of God the Father. Why? For our redemption. That was the plan. So here as we, this first point, before there was a sinner, there was a savior. Um, secondly, under, underneath, or the first point I guess we would say underneath this, this main point would be is there's a lamb spoken of. In Genesis 3.15, and I'll just read this one, uh, these briefly here. In Genesis 3.15 says, and I will put enmity. And here they, again, the idea is that there's a lamb spoken of. Verse 15, this is in Genesis chapter 3. Keep that in mind. This is in Revelation, the end of the book. This is at the beginning. And he says, and I will put enmity, uh, war, strife there. He says, between you and the woman. And put your seed and her seed, and he shall bring it out. Let me back up. Who's he talking to here? He's talking to Satan. This is who he's talking to in this text. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And here we see that ultimately there's a lamb here that's going to be, that's going to come though, to be able to be the sacrificial. Uh, representation to be able to take away the sting from this uh, from this um, occurrence uh, from our lives. And who was that? It was Jesus Christ. Immediately after sin entered the world, God began to reveal His plan for the redemption of sinners. So here, there's a lamb. Also, we would see there is also a lamb sent uh, in John chapter one and verse twenty nine. It says. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John knew exactly who he was. He says, that there, Here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So before there was a sinner, there was a Savior. There was a Lamb spoken of. There was a Lamb sent. And then ultimately we would say... And and ultimately, thanks be to the Lord, there was a lamb slain. We're not thankful necessarily for the realization that of his death, but we're thankful for what that brought, and it was eternal life. So, before there's a sinner, there's a savior, and a lamb slain. Revelation 13 and verse 8 says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Whose names have not been written in the lamb in the book of uh, life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Notice that verse again, Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Here, the idea here in this verse is that there is a lamb slain. And what is it followed by stating? He says, from the foundation of the world. Again, going back to the idea that this was before the foundation of the world was ever came about. This was the plan. So here, first, first point, before there was a sinner, there was a savior. Secondly, before there was guilt, there was grace. Before there was guilt, there was grace. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 9, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. And again, this thought here before there was guilt, there was grace. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 says, 
who has saved us, talking about Jesus Christ, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So once again, he says there in the middle of verse, or well, let's read it once more. He says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. That's each one of us. That's not just who, uh, who they're talking to here in this letter to Timothy. But he says, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Once again, Jesus Death on the cross, his propitiation for our sins was given before the foundation of the world. So, before guilt, there was grace. Also, we say there was also be, uh, before man ever strayed. In Isaiah 53, in verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. Now, ultimately, again, going back, and we're not trying to overestimate, overemphasize just this one point, but it all comes back to the central point of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. So, coming back to this verse where he says, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all we have turned everyone to his own way. Now here, even though this is an Isaiah in the Old Testament, one por portion you could say that was not revealed in this was also the Gentiles at this point. The Gentiles, uh, their part in this grace was not revealed. But in this, we could say that that was us as well in this verse, where he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Were we not all straying before we came to know Jesus Christ? Absolutely. And he says, we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. So, before man ever strayed, there was grace to bring him home. We see that even here in, in Isaiah 53 and verse 6. And ultimately, he's, he's foreshadowing here the idea of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Because that's ultimately what the uh, payment was going to be for it. So there was not only before man ever strayed, but also before man ever sinned. Uh, look over at Romans, back in the uh, New Testament, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. By the way, a little commercial while you're flipping there. Um, I know we go through a lot of scripture. Uh, we may mention this on Wednesday night. At the end of the day, I don't want you to remember anything that I say, because everything comes should come from the Word of God. That's where we get our truth. So you may say, man, there's a lot of different scriptures. I don't want you to remember my points. I remember, want you to remember what the Word of God says about these things. So if you say, man, it uses a lot of scripture. I hope so. I hope to. Right. Um, Probably a good thing I'm not going to do my own funeral. <laughs> um, might not come. <laughs> and I wouldn't even be doing the ones. Uh, Romans 3.23, uh, he says, all have, all, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So here the idea is before man ever sinned, there was grace. To make him clean. Notice that verse again. Very short verse. But for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here's the idea. God already knew we were going to fall short. He already knew that we were going to sin. And you know what the blessing is? He loved us anyway. Right. I'll give you two illustrations. That will ram this thought home. Think about Adam and Eve. They were created with the will not to sin, but to please their God. 
which they were perfectly justified in doing, they were perfectly uh, uh, happy with doing, until uh, Satan entered into the equation, tempted them and drew them away. Now, did God know that they were going to sin before they ever sinned? Absolutely. You know what the irony is? God knew that they were going to sin before he ever created them. So that's why I made the point early on. We have to get it in our heads that Jesus Christ coming to earth to be the savior of the world was not in, basically in, uh, in conclusion because of what man did. Man's not the one controlling this thing. It's God. We have to remember that. In so doing, then, going back to that thought, God still loved them. He still walked with them, as the Bible says, in the cool of the morning. He still fellowshiped with, he still fellowshiped with them. That's amazing. That's why I'm glad that I'm not omnipotent. Because most of us, we still live in this flesh, and if we knew that someone was going to do us wrong, would we still be friendly with them? Would we still love them as Jesus would have us do? Probably not. We're going with that. Then you come back to the New Testament, just in case you say, well, that's just the Old Testament. What about Judas? He, he, he chose Judas to carry the money, nonetheless. And then you say, well, that was Judas. He, you know, he already knew he was going to betray him and everything else. Well, then let's look at Peter and his denial. He knew that as well and still loved him. So what a blessing that is. So as we're looking at these verses, and then we come to Romans 3.23, which we can all quote in our sleep, but for all have... Uh, sin had fallen short of the glory of God, a very familiar portion of scripture. But do we understand the reality of that? Since we've all fallen short of the glory of God, that's exactly why Jesus came, was for us. So here, before man ever strayed, there was grace. Before man ever sinned, there was grace. That was, that was the plan. And then also before man ever became separated, there was grace. Notice over in Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. And, and, uh, I tell you what, let me read this one. You say in the New Testament. We're going to be right around where we just were. We're going to be, if you would, go to Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. And I'm going to read Isaiah 59 for you. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from God. Notice, it wasn't God. <laughs> he didn't do any wrong. It was our sins that separated us from God. And you know what the blessing, the hidden blessing in that verse is? He still loves us. Notice he doesn't say, You are the reason that we're separated from God. He said it's because of our sins that have separated us from God. That's a blessing. And then he goes on to say, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Why? Because he hates us? No. It's because he's holy. He can't look upon sin. So because of sin, he's turned his face away from us. It's even said of Jesus Christ at the point of crucifixion that the Father turned his face away. And I believe that that was, had to have been the hardest point for Jesus Christ. When his father could not look upon him because of the sin that he was taking upon himself. And then at the end of Isaiah 59 too, it says, And your sin have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So here we see that before man ever was separated, there was grace to reconcile him back to God. That was the plan. And it's also that grace that saves us. And then here in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, if you're there, he says, for by grace, Paul talking to the church of Ephesus, but he could be talking to the church of Rome. 
It says, For by grace you have been saved, how? Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, not of any, anything that we can do right. or not do. Lest anyone should boast, and we always add to that because we would. So Lord, by grace you've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. So there was grace to reconcile it back to God. And we would also say that same grace is sufficient for all of mankind. His blood that was shed was enough blood that was shed for the removal of all of mankind's sin. And to those who come to him. Notice in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. And that's quite the statement. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. What a blessing, right? It wasn't that as sin continued, then grace declined. God gave as much grace as was needed in your life, as much as was needed in my life, as was needed to bring you to redemption. You know, there's some of us here this morning, and you know that um, maybe you were involved in all kinds of sin before you came to know the Lord. And there's some that maybe you're raised in church and you didn't really get into a lot of sin. And, but you know what? That same grace that needed to abound in your life and in the, whether in whatever the case may be, as far as the sin in your life, it was there enough to handle whatever you had committed. And what a blessing that is. So here, second point is, is before there was guilt, there was grace. Third point is this, before there was the punishment of death, there was also the promise of life. Before there was the punishment of death, there was the promise of life. Over in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, just a few books over, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, I love that, at the end that he included that, who cannot lie, promised before time began. What did he promise? The hope of eternal life with God. That's what he's promised for you. That's what he's promised for me. So before there was the punishment of death, there was the promise of life. But who did he promise this to? Who did he, who was this for? To those who had come to Christ. Back over in John chapter 6 and verse 37. John chapter 6 and verse 37. It says, and all that the Father gives, gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For each one of us that comes to Jesus Christ. For the removal of our sins, the promise is, is that he will not cast us out. There's no sin too great. How many of you, if, uh, when in your witnessing, have come across individuals where they say, well, you know, I, I, can't, I can't accept Jesus Christ, I've done too much. Or you don't even know what I've done. And, you know, that's true. I don't have to know. You know, and then there's some people that just air everything. As if they're going to blow you away. And after a few years, you you kind of become numb to it in a sense. Because why? Because sin is sin. Sin is sin. Um, it doesn't, I'm, and I'm, I'm not downplaying sin. But I'm going to make this statement. It doesn't matter what your sin is as far as in redemption. Jesus Christ can forgive any sin. That's the blessing. That's why, that's really in the end of why each one of us have hope. Right. Because it's not like, well, if, if I did this over here, then he'll never forgive me. I can never come to him. That's a lie from Satan. So here, to those who would come to Christ, John, again, going back there to John chapter 6, verse 37, all the Father gives me will come to me. 
the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Then in Revelation, right on the heels of this, of this thought, Revelation 22, right at the end of, of the book, in verse 17, Revelation 22 and verse 17, says that the Spirit and the Bride say come. Exclamation point, by the way. And let him who hears say come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. So here we see those who would come to Christ who will in no means cast out. So before there was a punishment of death, there was the promise of life. To those who would come to Christ, also to those who would confess Christ. Uh, going back, I'll read this one for you just Briefly, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So some people would say, well, you know, well, I believe in Jesus Christ. He wants to hear it from our mouth. Why? Because we are in direct rebellion to him. Uh, I'll, I'll give you just as a quick uh, illustration. At the end of the Civil War, and this is not some history lesson, but it, it applies, so bear with me. At the end of the Civil War, whenever the Southerners were incorporated back into, um, into the, with the states, those who actually took up arms against the North actually had to swear allegiance verbally back to the North or back to the country, that they were not going to take up arms, etc., etc. So you say, okay, well, what, what's the point? They had to say that verbally. They had to promise to them that they were not going to do that anymore. They were not going to anyway I'm not going to get into the schematics however you want to look at it but rebel is how they looked at it rebel against the north anymore now as far as in our lives as sinners that's why confession has to be made verbally why Jesus wants to hear it from our mouth that we are not going to continue in our rebellion against him that we are going to live our lives in a different manner a different fashion as far as our allegiance is turning from sin and Satan in this world and our allegiance is now to God and Him alone. And that's what exactly what these verses are saying. He says in verse 10, Romans, not, uh, Romans 10, verse 10, he says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and that's all well and good because that's where it starts. God convicts our hearts. But he adds to that, it says, And with the mouth, Confession is made unto salvation. So here, we would say that also to those who would confess Christ. And then also the last point of this, before there was a punishment of death, there was a promise of life. To those who would claim Christ's death. It's not only confess Him, but also then claim Him. And in Romans 10, in verse 11, it says, For the scripture says, Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. Now, what does the word believe mean? And believes in him with the whole heart. We just read the verses uh, back there, um, back there in Romans chapter 10, where he says, For the heart, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. That's first and foremost. Then we come down um, into verse 11. He says, And that every tongue should confess the Lord Jesus is Lord in the glory of God the Father. And here uh, in this in this last thought is is here in, ver in um, verse eleven he goes on into this other thought he says for the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame why because we're not only uh, believing it in our heart but we're also saying it with our mouth and then it comes to this idea that we also then can claim him as our savior why because we've done everything that he's commanded. We believe in our hearts. He's done the work in our hearts to bring that about. 
We have confessed him, and now we can basically hold him and then as our Savior, as our Lord. And then the last point is this, before there was a hell, there was a heaven. Before there was a hell, there was a heaven. In Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 4, it states, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It goes on again in Matthew 25, and there's verse 34. It says that the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So even, even, this, even heaven itself had in mind the preparation that we would be there for all of eternity. For each one of us to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. And who is this for? Number one, we would say it's for the, for the redeemed, for the saved. In John chapter 14, uh, and over in verses 1 through 3, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. We usually read these verses at funerals, but it's also good for the living. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Again, this is John 14, verse, uh, beginning of verse 1 down through verse uh, 3. He says, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, once again, like we read earlier, I would have told you, I'm not lying to you. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And once again, that's a, a sincere blessing. Uh, this, this is not, again, a promise for the dead. They already know about it. They're already there. It's a promise for us, for the living. To those of us who are known Christ as the redeemed. So before there was a hell, there was a heaven. And we see that it was prepared. It was created. Ultimately, not only for the residence of God himself, but ultimately one day that we're going to live there with him as well. So it's not only for the redeemed people, but also the righteous people. And we would point out that it's not in our righteousness, but in Christ's righteousness that he imparts to us. In Philippians 3, 9, it says that be found in him. Those of us who are in Christ will be found in him, not having my own righteousness. It's not in anything just that Vaughn can do to, to inherit eternal life or our, my own righteousness to do anything. And you can put your own name in there. And it says, which is from the law, that that which is through faith in Christ, having placing our faith in what Christ has already done, what he has done. It says that the righteousness which is from God by faith or carried out by faith. So, hell was, or heaven was not only for the redeemed people, but for the righteous people, and lastly, for the reconciled people. And for each one of us, that's who we are if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're the reconciled people. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 says, In Him we have redemption. How? How is this made? Through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of His grace. Notice again, it's not in anything that we have done. It's not in anything we can inherit. But He says, in Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Uh, Alan made that comment in, in Sunday school. Is the fact that from beginning to end, it's all of the Lord. He's the one that convicts our hearts of sin. He's the one that... That brings us to the realization that, hey, I need a Savior. And, 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 then he, and then he goes from there. How? Then he not only convicts our hearts, but he brings us to the point of salvation. He does the saving in our hearts. And then he does the work afterwards. Uh, the sanctification process. He's the one doing that. It's not like, hey, all right, I saved you now. You know, I wish you luck. He's the one that continues to be with us. He gives us his Holy Spirit 
that is the comforter, and he also convicts our hearts of sin. And what a blessing that is. He doesn't just save us to leave us. He continues with us until the very end. So here, we would say that it, so before there was a hell, there was a heaven, and it was for the redeemed people, the right, righteous people, those uh, who have been given the righteousness of Christ, and parted that to us, and for the reconciled people, they're forgiven. So here are the conclusion. I'm just going to read two verses to you. Number one is this. See, First Corinthians 2, 9. It says, But as as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, we have a great glimpse of what heaven's going to be like in Revelation. But I think there's going to be a whole lot more than what really meets the eye there in Revelation. Why? Because I believe it's personally part of the mystery. <coughs> Some things we don't really have to know. He gives us enough, enough glimpse to be able to realize that, hey, what we're going to take part in, what is truly waiting for us when we leave this world, is going to be true glory. But why? What is the main purpose? Is it because, well, you know, hey, at least we're going to be out of here. We get to be in heaven. And we're going to have our own mansion. And, you know, and all is going to be well. And we sit around, you know, with our little heart. It's not the picture, is it? What's the picture? <laughs> Glorifying Him. Serving Him. Once again, why we were created. It goes back to Him reconciling, making right. What was torn apart because of sin in the garden. He restores. He makes all things new. Why? Just so we can ooh and all over God's creation again? No. So that we might glorify Him. Amen. That's why He's created us. And then in Romans 8, um, in verse 17, He says, And if children, if we're then children, if we truly know Him as Savior, Twelve o'clock. <laughs> um, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if we indeed, if indeed we suffer with him. Notice that. Nobody likes this part. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You know, a lot of a lot of the disciples. Um, most of them all, except for two, were actually martyred for the faith. But they looked at, they counted it joy. Mm -hmm. Why? How, how can an individual think of that as joy, being martyred? How can the early Christians who were marched into the arenas with their families just to be torn together by lions or other gladiators. How could they walk into that picture with joy? Because they realize that this life and the life to come isn't about us. That's how we started this whole thing off. It's about God. And, and He is in control of our days. He's in control of our birth. And He's in control of our death. That's the God who we serve. Amen. And we should be thankful for his plan. Not only the plan in himself, but also the plan that he has for us. And realizing that this whole plan is for one purpose, and that's to glorify him. So may we be forever thankful for God's eternal sovereignty, his provision, his redemption. And I would say also both for our good and for his eternal glory. That's why he does what he does and will continue to throughout all of eternity. And that's why he saved us, is to glorify him, to bring him praise from before the foundation of the world. So in all of these things... We pointed out is for the one purpose of realizing that God has uh, had this plan since before the foundation of the world occurred.
for the one purpose, this is again, the reign of home, for his glory. And ultimately we add to that for our good. And what a blessing it is to be able to serve a God that in, as we look around in this, all of this creation that we see around us the other night, um, even in Hopewell with all the smog, um, it was neat just walking out and just taking some trash out, just looking up and seeing the stars you could see. Uh, it was a blessing. You know, just sit there and realize everything you see up there is from God. And you think about how immense space is with all of the galaxies and everything else. And yet he came to die for you and for me. What a blessing that is. Ultimately, again, for his glory. So what a blessing. Well, let's go to the word of prayer as we have. Father, we just thank you so much just for your word this morning. We're thankful to God just for your sovereignty in our lives this morning. We're thankful to your Father for your goodness this morning. We're thankful that you're in control this morning. We look at a world that seems totally out of control, and that's because you lifted your hand off of it. I truly believe. I believe that at times it's not just hellfire and brimstone as far as your judgment, but it's letting this world have its way. And I pray, your Father, that you'd help us, even as your children, to be able to recognize that and to realize that we don't know when you're coming back. Help us to be faithful to your God in the days you give to us. Help us to be constantly warning and telling and sharing with people about your coming. But it's not only just in that fear of what would happen if they do not trust in you, but it's also in sharing the joy of having a life and living a life of knowing you. And what a blessing it is. And that's not just for all of eternity in heaven, but that's for here. You've made that possible. You've made that joy possible for here. And I pray, your Father, that you'd help us to take joy in what you've done for us, to take joy in who you are. And I pray, your Father, that you'd help us to glorify you in our lives and all things. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a short time of invitation. And if the Lord has spoken to your heart, give an opportunity to be able to come and talk to the Lord, and, and maybe even today, it's maybe just a, giving an opportunity just to thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. I think these verses all share with that same theme in mind, of being able to be thankful to the Lord for what He's doing for us, for who He is, and I would encourage you maybe to even spend a little time just thanking the Lord this morning for all that He is accomplishing in your life, in my life, around in this world. He's continuing to do that. Um, again, for our good and for his glory. We we'll give you an opportunity for you to come or spend some time there at your seat. And uh, we would turn to page number 280. 280. Software and gender. <laughs>
who you are in our lives. We thank you, dear Father, for, for yourself. And thank you, dear Father, that you convicted our hearts the day that each one of us came to know you. Thank you for that day. And I pray, dear Father, you help us to be eternally grateful for that day. But I pray that in the days ahead, you'd help us to do something with that salvation that you've given to us. Help us, your Father, to realize that it's not to be squandered, but I pray you'd help us to realize that it's to live for you, and to share with others, and to encourage others, your Father, in, in so doing. And I pray, your Father, you'd help us not to squander our faith as, as the unjust steward who wouldn't give uh, his talent in the ground because of out of fear. But I pray, your Father, you'd help us to Truly do everything that we can do, your Father, and serve you. Have a heart of love and devotion. Not only for what you do for us, but for who you are. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.